please welcome back to the stage, Susan Angeli. Okay, welcome back. So uh, I am, uh, have the distinct pleasure of also introducing our next panel, uh, which I'm incredibly excited about. What I'm gonna do is, is ask everyone who's on the panel to, to please come up to the stage now, uh, and then um, I'll, I'll introduce everyone. Um, and, and while they're coming up, just a, a little bit of background on this. Uh, this, this is both sort of the, the middle of a conversation and uh, a real uh, elevation of the conversation in a really exciting way. There have been a, a lot of discussions offline about um, there are a number of groups uh, working, of course, in the board diversity space and, and how can they all work together. Um, there have been dinner conversations, breakfast conversations, various configurations. Uh, and, and, and this one, uh, I think, is, is a first, as I understand it, that uh, the uh, board level representatives of each of the main, uh, really prominent uh, diversity groups are, are here uh, to discuss how we can all work together uh, to, uh, to raise the level of diversity in the board overall. So. I am going to start by introducing uh, our moderator, the Honorable Ken Salazar, immediately to my left. Uh, he is a partner at the law firm uh, Wil Wilmer Hale, uh, also the former secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior, uh, former Colorado U.S. Senator, uh, and Attorney General. Uh, and uh, to, uh, to his left is Matthew Fust. Uh, Matt is a senior advisor to Quorum uh, and Out Leadership. Uh, Quorum, uh, as, uh, as many of you know, is the board level uh, LBGT focused initiative of Out Leadership. Uh, he is the former C, uh, uh, SVP and CFO at Onyx Pharmaceuticals, and he is a director of uh, Atara Biotherapeutics, uh, Dermira, uh, Macrogenetics, Ultragenics Pharmaceuticals, and Blackthorns Therapeutics. So, so one or two boards. <laughs> uh, next is Kapila Anan. Uh, Kapila is a uh, retired partner of KPMG uh, and uh, director of the Women Corporate Directors Education and Development Foundation. Uh, she also is on the board of Extended Stay America. Uh, next is John Rogers, who is the chairman and CEO uh, and chief investment officer of Ario Investments, uh, the founder of Black Corporate Directors Conference, uh, and a director at both Exelon and McDonald's. Uh, and then last but not least is Ekta Singh Bouchel, who is the former Chief Operating Officer at uh, the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, a director of uh, Teletech, and uh, is uh, a uh, member of Ascend Pinnacle. So, over to you. Thank you very much. So, uh, let me start out by, uh, first of all, saying that uh, LCDA has come a long ways in a very few short years, and uh, I can think of uh, no one better to be running this great organization than someone who has been in the trenches changing the world for a couple of decades, and that's uh, Esther Aguilera. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and I gotta say this about uh, Pat Pineda. You know, Pat uh, serves on a number of boards, Toyota and other things, but uh, she has been one of the spark plugs of this organization and making sure that we're pushing forward with diversity and creating the kinds of bridges that you see personified up here on the stage today. So thank you, Pat, for chairing the organization and for your leadership. And I have to say, give her a round of applause too. <laughs> now, in th these days of my world uh, beyond the government, I, uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer and I do litigation, Native American and energy work. But I also have the honor of serving on a couple of boards, on the Mayo Clinic Board of Trustees, which is a nonprofit, uh, but then also on the Target Corporation Board of Trustees, Board of Directors. And uh, we're fortunate that a person that you have seen 
in the African American community and women's leadership and LGBTQ uh, efforts uh, from sea to shining sea in all 50 states day by day, who engineered, I think, the, 50, the first $50,000 annual commitment to uh, LCDA. Uh, and that's the president of the Target uh, Foundation, uh, Laisha Ward. Laisha, please stand. So we, uh, our panel today is uh, Diversity Allies, U.S., <coughs> Latino, Pan-Asian American, African American women, and LGBTQ, and uh, how we as uh, directors can work uh, strategically together. And we'll hear from Mekta John, Kapila, and Matt about some of their ideas on uh, what is happening within their organizations. And also, my hope is that we come out of here with some action items. So at the end of this, uh, there are some cards that somebody's going to pass around sometime in the middle of this program. And I'm going to ask you to put down in uh, five words or less two ideas. And each idea has to start with an action verb, like create a pledge for diversity or whatever it is that you might want. And I, I'm going to ask you all to do that if my fellow <coughs> panelists, uh, I'm sure they will agree because we had a phone call about this. Uh, there are things that have happened in the law sector, which is where I'm from, where uh, in the state of Colorado, when I joined uh, my first law firm back in 1981, I was the only person of color in the entire firm. And we led an effort in the 80s to create a pledge for diversity, which is working well in the firm. Last week in uh, Colorado, we uh, celebrated uh, through the Women's uh, Leadership Education Foundation what is happening in <coughs> board of directors in Colorado and the Women's Foundation there started an initiative about two and a half years ago with some help from some of us here in this room. And what they were doing was celebrating what was happening with uh, corporate boards in the state of Colorado, including by bringing women and, and, and minorities on the board. Newmont Mining Corporation, now you think about Newmont Mining, you don't usually think about a mining company as being very open to diversity. But Gary Goldberg and uh, Noreen Dolan, who is the chairman of the board, were honored at this event because from just a few short years ago till today, they now have five women on their board of directors. This is the largest gold mining company in the entire world. And they talked about the importance of profitability, corporate governance, in terms of having that kind of inclusion. So I'd like, and, and that's come out of an action item that they started just two and a half years ago. They've asked the governor of Colorado to send out a letter to all of the corporate CEOs, some 110 of them in the state of Colorado, saying that he, they should be putting uh, people of color and uh, diverse people on their boards because there's still about 60% of the boards in the state of Colorado that don't have a single diverse person on their board. And so while progress is being made, a lot more has to be made. So bottom line is we'd like to collect your ideas. Esther will then take those ideas and then lots of things will spring from, from this. So we want this to be an action-oriented uh, kind, of, uh, kind of panel. So with that, uh, you've heard the, the introductions. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, uh, start out by asking a, uh, a question. And that is, uh, my first question is going to go to Matt and to John. Matt, well, let, me, let me start this. I, I think what I'd like to do is to give each uh, they'll just go starting with you, Matt. Uh, and tell us a little bit about your organization and tell us about what it is that you're doing and what your views are on diversity and inclusion of, of, of people from different backgrounds on corporate boards of directors. So let's start with you, Matt. Sure, thank you. So uh, Quorum is uh, I think probably the youngest, newest of the organizations focusing on underrepresented communities in the boardroom. Uh, Quorum was founded uh, just four or five years ago initially as a nonprofit. It's now part of Out Leadership, uh, which is a B Corp based here in New, in New York City uh, that's focused on LGBT uh, talent development inside corporations as well as on boards. Um, as with a lot of underrepresented communities, I think the conversation initially started on the supply side. Where is the talent? Well, there aren't any LGBT directors who are out because there aren't sufficiently qualified candidates. So the initial effort over the first couple of years of the organization was building a database of qualified candidates. Uh, turns out that Field of Dreams was wrong. We built it and still no one came. Uh, so we've begun to shift more attention to the demand side of the equation. Um, one of the things we kicked off earlier this year 
was an effort to look through the board diversity guidelines that uh, initially the Fortune 500 companies publish uh, that says, how do we pick our directors uh, as companies? Uh, and some really interesting insights. Um, happily, uh, I think in part due to the work of Mary Jo White and the SEC, nearly every publicly traded company now puts in its proxy statement some statement uh, about its diversity policies and its approaches. But surprisingly, as we look through the data, although nearly every company mentions diversity, not a lot are very specific about what that means. Only about 60% of companies mention gender diversity, 40, 50% mention race or ethnicity as characteristics as they look for directors that are either considered or sought. Uh, and as evidence of work ahead for the LGBT community, less than 1% mention sexual orientation or gender identity as a characteristic of board diversity. Uh, so long journey ahead there. Um, and as we, I'm glad you're asking for some specific items because some of the things that we've been focused on here in 2017 are encouraging companies to take a fresh look at what they say about themselves in terms of what board diversity means and how they seek it and also to ramp up their efforts to capture and report that information. And so we can talk more about that as well. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Kapila. So women corporate directors, uh, most of you uh, know it lovingly as WCD, and I know there are a number of members. Could you just raise your hand? So you know there are a number. So there's a number in the audience here. Um, is uh, actually about 2,000 plus uh, female members from around the world uh, in about 80 chapters. And um, we are very proud of the fact that we're global. Uh, and from a, uh, in terms of age, since we're talking about that, um, WCD has actually been around about 15 years, but the, really the progress uh, and the growth in our chapters has come in the last five, uh, five to six years. But uh, when you take a look at our numbers, um, you know, we still hear the same thing, uh, Matt, that you have, and I'm sure we'll hear this from other people, uh, that when people are looking to put uh, women on their boards, uh, they can't find qualified candidates. So our focus, and I think the earlier panel uh, touched on this as well, is really to get to the NomGov chairs um, and try to have a conversation around what is it that is preventing uh, the, let's call it the traditional networks from finding diverse candidates. Um, and I really applaud LCDA for bringing us all together because I think one of the things that we've learned over the years is that there's strength in numbers. Uh, and when we're looking for diversity on, on boards, and it's not just identity diversity, although that's where we're sort of focused here today, but it's diversity period. It really helps if all of the organizations are able uh, to come together and talk about that business imperative. It's, it's sad, in 2017, you still have to keep talking about why it makes good business sense uh, to be diverse, but unfortunately, I think I've learned uh, that um, it, it never uh, hurts to say it one more time. So we're focused on getting the message out in terms of the value of diversity and really trying to connect the dots in terms of the qualified diverse candidates and the NomGov chairs. Thank you very much. Uh, John, the man from Chicago. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, this is really exciting to have all, I think nothing like this has ever happened before, to have the leaders of all the organizations here. So it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, let um, me just say one quick word about John. He knows how to put together big events. <laughs> I saw him put together an inauguration event in 2009. <laughs> So he knows how to put big deals together. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I was honored to be one of the co-chairs of the inauguration in, back in 09, which was really a, a special experience. So thank you. I know you were there, too. And so, so. Um, so I think with the, our, for our initiative, the Black Corporate Directors Conference was started roughly 15, 16 years ago. Uh, Russell Reynolds and their senior partner, Charles Tribbett, was our original partner and continues to be our partner um, all these years. And we started out with about 30 um, directors at the Gleacher Center at the University of Chicago Business School, and it's slowly but surely grown. Um, Dick Parsons told us we should move it out of a business school and invite spouses and significant others, and we moved it to Laguna Beach about 10 years ago, and it's really flourished. This last year, we had over 200 directors, and with people bringing guests, it's now we had over 350 people uh, at the conference. We've also added more and more Latino directors, too, to our conference, which is something that has been really exciting to, to bring that, and also uh, really diverse speakers from all different walks of life. 
one of the differences about our conferences, though, it's not so much to, we obviously, of course, want more of us and more diverse board members is something everyone agrees with and is, is important, but our initiative has really been around two key things. How we, as minority directors, can be leaders in the boardroom, learn from each other how to be effective and make a difference once we're there, and then secondly, how do we lean in and make a difference around the civil rights agenda and the inclusion agenda once we're in the boardroom? The hypothesis is that too many of us get quiet and shy mm -hmm. when you're the only person of color, you're the only diverse director. You don't speak up and speak out, and then nothing changes. And you give the, you know, the status quo kind of permission to keep doing things the same way, because if the diverse director doesn't speak out, the CEO assumes everything must be A-OK. -okay. So it's something that uh, has really worked well for us to have that focus, and every year what we do, is, beside having you know, terrific CEO speakers like you guys have here, we always have what we call the conscience of the conference, someone who's there to remind people of the importance of fighting for civil rights. And it can be you know, Bruce Gordon, who ran the NAACP. It can be John Lewis. We've had, we've had Reverend Jackson, of course. Uh, we had Harry Belafonte, who, you know, of course, marched with Dr. King. Um, we've had Eric Holder, Valerie Jarrett. It's just been you know, a phenomenal success. And the idea is, again, to remind everyone of the responsibility we have to fight for civil rights and to measure the things that are so important. So measuring the diversity of the management team, diversity of the professional services firms that supply services to our corporations, um, measure the spending with minority-owned firms, not just construction and catering firms, but how people are spending money with professional services firms, keeping track by category, and also finally keeping track of the uh, philanthropy to make sure that dollars are flowing to organizations like this that matter, civil rights organizations that matter, and uh, holding companies accountable to make sure the money doesn't always go to the symphony and the opera and the local university, but is engaged and involved with the kind of issues that we all care about. Okay. So that's us. Thank you very much, John. Ekta? So one of the advantages of going last is that, um, you know, Ascend, I can talk um, about Ascend Pinnacle more briefly because a lot of what Ascend Pinnacle is focused on, you know, all of these organizations have been working on for a lot longer. So Ascend Pinnacle was founded in 2013 uh, with a single goal, uh, and that was really to create a platform to support, leverage, um, and really create the network for both existing Asian corporate directors as well as um, those who are aspiring to become future corporate board directors, but also to, to put a spotlight on the issues that everyone here is talking about, right? And there's a multitude of issues. So that was sort of the, the fundamental premise of Ascend Pinnacle. And we also laid out a goal for ourselves, right? We said, well, how are we going to measure success? Um, and success for us is quite simply um, ensuring that the number of new Asian corporate directors on Fortune 500 boards every year reflects fairly the representation of Asians in the United States. And so in 2015, um, that was about 6.8%. And um, like I said, we're on this journey um, and we're very much at the start of this journey. Um, and um, you know, the recent Alliance for Board Diversity study that came out last year really confirmed some of the facts that we heard this morning um, you know, from Corn Ferry, um, that we have a lot of progress to make. We're in the one to two percent, depending on which study you rely on. Um, but that is really what success um, will look like. And it's important for each one of us to know what those three or four things are that are going to demonstrate success, because this is a long journey. And for those who've been on this journey a lot longer than we have, um, it's going to take time. Um, it is glacial, as Mary Jo said, uh, and hopefully for many of us it will happen in our lifetimes. And I think, you know, the, the, the most important thing, there are lots and lots of surveys, and yes, Kapila's right, we're still talking about, you know, the business case for this. Um, there's a 2015 McKinsey study that uh, I, uh, you know, I found really resonates in my conversations with others. Um, and yes, you know, gender diversity is definitely strongly correlated to financial performance, but racial and ethnic diversity is even more strongly correlated to financial performance. Um, and I think, you know, we, it's, we just can't stop talking about it. So uh, let me start out with a second question. I'll start Ekta and, and John with, uh, with both of you first and the others can pipe in. So 
You know, one of the really historic things about this is that we have all of you up here on this stage. Uh, you know, sometimes you think about how we silo ourselves in our civil rights efforts. All of us believe in inclusion and we notice when you're in a boardroom and uh, there's no one who is uh, of a diverse background or you're in a crowd and there's nobody who's from a diverse background. And so there's a power here. There is a great and unique power which all of you represent. How can we band that power together of the Asian American world, the African American world, women, LGBTQ, to even do a better job than what we're trying to do individually within our organizations? Ekta? Um, and I think that power that you talked about um, is, is exponential. Um, and so I'll just share some, uh, an important and, but powerful fact, right? So Gallup in 2012 did a survey. And coming out of the survey, they looked at um, the self-identification of LGBTQ uh, across different um, ethnicities. So Asian Americans self-identified, about 4.3% of Asian Americans self-identified as LGBTQ, 4.6% um, uh, African Americans, um, I think it was like 4% uh, Latino, um, and then you know 3.4 were Caucasians, and then the the entire population was in the three three and a halfs, right? So if you literally, you know, if you think about the responsibility that we have, and you start looking at well, okay, as an Asian American, I'm actually um, I need to speak on behalf of my LGBTQ stakeholders, right? And then there is lots and lots and lots of data that says, well, you know, we're not living in these mutually exclusive um, ethnic circles, right? So you start drawing those Venn diagrams, these five circles um, that represent all our um, membership bodies. And the fact of the matter is, in total, we're over 255 million of the US population. We, we owe it to each other, right? And to be that voice um, and to represent more than just, you know, what Ascend Pinnacle or BCDC or any of us stand for. Um, and so, so, you know, at Ascend Pinnacle, we've, um, we are in formal partnerships um, with everyone on this panel as well as the 30% coalition, and I know you're gonna be hearing from them um, later on. Um, and um, it, it, these partnerships in motion, which is what Ascend Pinnacle um, calls these, um, are really powerful because we're all learning from each other, but we're also flag bearers for each other. Um, so one of the most important lessons that we've learned at Ascend Pinnacle is that it's not sufficient to task just the few that have made it to the boardroom with this shared collective mission, right? Um, it's really, really important that it be two ways. Um, and so we call it sort of push and pull for Ascend Pinnacle. Um, the push comes from the aspiring Asian corporate directors who have to reach out to not just the Asian corporate directors, but to everyone here and everyone that they can connect with, that they come across. And the pull um, is basically those of us who are on boards pulling, reaching out, sponsoring, guiding, counseling, not, those, those, not just those of our um, ethnicity or our memberships, but really broadly. Um, and that's, that's the way we're going to make this happen. John? Well, I would add two things. I think it is a starting place, and I think we should try to take this panel on the road and uh, you know, be at each other's conferences at least for a year and uh, have this story told in front of all the audiences. I think that would be a starting point. I know there's been some discussion of getting together between you know, conferences and having dialogue and discussion. I think that should happen you know, at least once or twice a year, that we could be together, have lunch, dinner, half day together, and sort of plot and plan and figure out how we can all work together and help each other and support each other, because I think there isn't enough of that in the boardroom where, where we're thinking about each other in strategic ways. So I think we need to stay in touch, and I think it's such a great start today. I'll just add one thing. Um, at our Ascend Pinnacle inaugural corporate director conference earlier in the year, and John was there, um, and Pat was there, and others were there, um, we had a great story from Meg Whitman. Um, so it was actually Reverend Jesse Jackson who challenged Meg Whitman that the HP board didn't have enough minorities and women. Mm. Um, and so, you know, if I think of sort of the 
and I'm, I'm, I'm grossly generalizing, but you know, the, the typical Asian director, you know, how do we overcome our shyness? Well, you get John or Reverend Jesse Jackson or somebody <laughs> else to say it. Good, good, good. So uh, Kapila and Matt, um, when you hear these ideas coming uh, from Ekta and from John uh, in the context of women or LGBTQ, what do you think from the, your perspectives uh, we ought to be doing as a collective to advance the collective agenda? So I, th I think you know some of it's already been said, um, but one of the things that I always remember about John <clears throat> from my days at KPMG, um, I was on the diversity advisory board and John was one of our external advisors and he would always stress supplier diversity. And you talked about it earlier today. Um, I do think that's one of the topics that we all need to really be focused on. So um, whether it is from the professional services firms as you're talking about them, and John does a much better job, by the way, of, of talking about these than I do. But I do, I, I remember that in boardrooms, and I remember that when uh, the WCD members get together, is that is one way in which it may not be just diversity in the boardroom, but it's diversity overall. Um, and when we all pull each other up, that, that makes a difference. So I'd say that's one thing that I'm going to uh, re-emphasize from, from John's comments. Um, the other is uh, that as from an advocacy standpoint, we all have issues because for many of us, uh, being 501c3s, we do have that issue about how much we can in fact advocate, but there is an, a, an aspect of advocacy that I'd love to see our organizations talking about um, together. Uh, and, and we've talked about it in, in different ways, talking to each other at conferences, et cetera, but I mean advocating for outside of our group. Because one of the things that um, from WCD, you know, when I was thinking back to lessons learned, and I wasn't there at the very beginning of the journey, but um, you know, in the beginning we all talked and we all agreed with each other, right? Because we were all talking within uh, the gender diversity spectrum. And then we realized, well, okay, well talking among ourselves is really not gonna get us anywhere. Uh, and then we started to broaden out and have that conversation in, in different forums. And I feel like that's what needs to happen, not just to your point, in the conferences that we all have, but really inviting in, let's say, the, the members that are not diverse and having that conversation with them because I think in many cases, they hear examples, whether it's the HP example or other examples, and they take them away and they use them elsewhere um, in, in, in the broader audience. So first I'd say is advocacy. The second I'd say is um, trying to talk outside of our group, and then the third, which I mentioned earlier, and I really believe um, is an avenue, although not as broad as the first two, is getting the nominating and governance chairs together to really understand what they need to be able to see all of our candidates from a board standpoint. Um, because we may know our own specific candidates, but I don't know that we know each other's candidates as well. So when they call and say, you know, X position or Y position, you really need to be giving them the people who qualify, but broader than our own respective organizations. So those are the three things that, that I'd say. So let me uh, just comment some on supplier diversity, and <coughs> many of you have been on this march through the 70s, 80s, 90s to today. And uh, as Nilsson would, will know, for example, in the professional circles of lawyers, most uh, <coughs> law firms uh, don't have a lot of diversity. So we've been working on that. But part of what I've learned is uh, that one of the companies that's always been a great supporter of all of our causes, LCDA, is Mass Mutual. They have a great corporate diverse uh, board and they do a lot on the supply side. And their general counsel, who's a white male, basically sent out the word that uh, he wanted to see people of color and women uh, in the meetings. He said, uh, every time I'm working with this firm, this is two, three years ago, he said, his name is Mark Rolig, and he would be proud that I'm telling this story about him. But he said, every time that I uh, sit down with uh, the law firm, it's the same white lawyers that I've been dealing with for the last 20 years. And so he said, I'm gonna fire the firm. So he fired the firm. And he says, I'm gonna start, uh, you know, from here on, it's, you know, I wanna see women and African Americans and others when I come into into, the, into these meetings. So to your point on uh, supplier diversity, it's something that we have been on. And so in some ways, you know, as a member of a board of directors, you have a very significant influence on the manager ranks and what happens with supplier diversity. John? Yeah, just to follow up on that, and we've talked about this in the hall earlier, is that the term supplier diversity is sort of 40 years out of date. 
-hmm. You know, the economy now is, I think it's um, way more professional services, financial services, technology, and traditional sort of manufacturing supply chain has become a much smaller part of our economy. That's just the facts of it. And when it comes to where the wealth and power and influence are in today, today's society, it's, again, it's the billionaires in Silicon Valley, it's the private equity guys, the Henry Kravitzes, the David Rubensteins, it's the heads of the law firms, the heads of the big audit and consulting firms. You know, that's where the world is, you know, our governor in Illinois is a private equity guy. Mitt Romney was a private equity person. You know, Mayor Bloomberg was a, you know, technology and financial services person, et cetera, et cetera. So I've had this conversation with literally 20 university presidents, and every single one, except for Bob Zimmer at the University of Chicago, says, oh, well, we use minority contractors, we use minority construction firms, we use minority caterers. And I've said, that's a modern day Jim Crow. <laughs> you can't say the black and brown folks and the women do the catering and the construction, and the white men get to be David Rubenstein and Henry Kravitz. It just is kind of crazy. But that's what we've allowed to happen over and over again. That's a good point. Thank you, John. Um, so Matt, let me ask you a question. Following, I want your ideas too in terms of LGBTQ, but you think about uh, the civil rights movement and Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall. Uh, you think about uh, the Latino community and uh, the formation of the GI Forum back in the 40s and a whole host of things. Think about the Asian American community and people like uh, Senator Danny Inouye who uh, championed uh, recognition of the Japanese internment camps as part of our history. Uh, the LGBTQ world, in terms of uh, at least the civil rights movement of our country, is uh, a more modern movement. It, the, obviously, discrimination existed way back then, but there's been a sea change in that, it seems to me, in the 90s and into, into this, this time. How do we work with you and you work with us to be able to advance this collective agenda that we're speaking about up here? Well, uh, so I can start with a term I learned from my daughter, which is one of the great reasons to have children, which is intersectionality. And you made the point, Hector, earlier that all of these communities increasingly are overlapping. And so I think you know, that's certainly something that my kids understand, that I think many of my peers, perhaps, in the boardroom have not yet figured out where there still is much more of a siloed mentality or a 30 or 40 years out of date mentality. Um, and I do think, picking up on one of the observations you made earlier, uh, it's a little bit of the, the mirror image of what you were talking about as we look inward with our individual groups like this one, but also recognizing that one of the great things about board of directors is they're democracies, right? Everyone gets a vote, everyone gets a share uh, on the agenda. And you know, as, as you're thinking about things to write down on the uh, pieces of paper on your table, one of the easy things that occurs to me is um, for nom and gov committees in particular, but boards generally, to take a look at, for example, what might be some of the boilerplate language about what does diversity mean as we think about selecting our directors and actually making that specific and making it intentional. So as you look at, for example, your board capability matrix, or your board selection guidelines when you go <coughs> back to your next board meeting, does it make a difference to say whether you seek diversity or you only consider diversity? I would posit you ought to have that conversation at your board. Um, and thinking about what are the categories of diversity, both of identity as well as perspective, that actually make a difference. And my hope is that merely catalyzing those conversations starts to have an impact when there's next a board opening or when a search is next conducted. So as uh, individual members of boards, uh, each one of you serves on boards. Uh, what advice would you give to our other board members who are assembled here on uh, how it is that they should advance the agenda within the boards that you already serve? Uh, if you're one member of your board uh, uh, and everybody else is white, what, what do you, how do you do it? Do you go and talk to the CEO and just say, hey, you know, uh, for uh, the America of 2017, this isn't right? Uh, do you go talk to your fellow board members, to the head of Nama and Gov? What advice would you would you give? Let me let me start with you, Matt. Uh, so I, I do think having that conversation and ensuring that the topic of diversity is actively considered in the context of board development is critically important. Uh, I'll tell a story on one of my companies, although out of courtesy I won't name them. 
uh, we, uh, we had identified an opportunity for a changeover of one of the board seats. The conversation began as they always do, hey, I know a guy um, who turned out to be a white guy. Uh, but I will say that having created a board capability matrix that in the context of the industries I work with includes things like experience in pharmaceutical development and commercialization now has a row that says diversity on. And everyone came to a full stop at our eight men and one woman all white board and said, hmm, maybe I know a guy is not the right answer at this point. Uh, and didn't take a lot, didn't take a lot just to introduce that pause into the conversation. Uh, and so I really encourage, again, as folks think about their own board development efforts, if you haven't built a capability matrix that explicitly includes board diversity, easy step to start that conversation. That'd be my bone on the So many of you are on, I think almost everybody here is on a corporate board. Uh, how many of your boards have a corporate diversity matrix? Raise your hand if uh, you're aware of your boards. How many of yours, how many do not? So maybe a, creating a corporate diversity matrix might be a good thing. Uh, what do you think about that, John? What, what exactly is it? What, what do you mean by that? Okay. So what, what we've done with some, but not yet all of my companies, though I'm working on it, uh, is um, led by the Nom and Gov Committee. Um, the board set out, here are the capabilities that we believe we need to have as a board. Uh, so in the case of my industries, it's experience developing drugs, commercializing drugs, regulatory experience. Um, and we've now explicitly said, and one thing we're gonna consider is, do we have a board that looks like our employee base, that looks like our customer base? Mm -hmm. So I think that is you know, terrific. Most of my boards do that, and I think that's important. And I've been fortunate to be on some really progressive boards like Exelon with Nelson and for years and years, and McDonald's, where they've had long histories of really concern around these issues. So I think that's great. The thing that we've pushed them to do, and Exelon's done this better than anyone, and McDonald's is starting to do it too, is now they have a matrix at Exelon of keeping track of all the spending by category of everything they do. And I sit down once uh, a year with the head of diversity and inclusion, and I can sit there and see, okay, you know, we have utilities in Baltimore, Philadelphia, D.C., and Chicago. How much are we spending with minority advertising agencies? Uh, how much are we spending with minority uh, law firm? Whatever. We can go through category by category in quite a bit of detail once a year and then hold people accountable going forward. So having a matrix to be able to see all the spending so it can't be just one big supply chain contract again, make people feel good if they're doing zero with inv you know, minority investment bankers, for example, or uh, investment managers or mutual fund companies for the 401k, whatever it happens to be. We want to be included in everything and keeping that matrix, I th matrix is important. And they do it well. Uh, McDonald's has done it now with six categories. They've done technology, they've done legal, they've done marketing, et cetera. And they're moving toward doing it a broader like Exelon. The second thing that Exelon does really well, run by a guy named Bill Von Haney, who Nelson knows quite well, they hold all their, their professional services suppliers and their banks and insurance companies accountable for the diversity of the teams that represent them on the Exelon account. Mm. And like was talked about earlier, uh, you know, as the secretary talked about, they will fire the law firm or the investment bank or the bank if they don't have diversity on the team. And then they celebrate once a year with a big dinner with the uh, CEO and the CFO and the general counsel to recognize and honor the firms that have made progress on their diversity and inclusion on the teams that you know, support Exelon. So I think that's the best matrix that I've seen. And I think asking those two questions consistently is something that all of us as directors can make a difference. Asking for those two things, then you know, it's hard for people to say, we're not gonna share the information with you. Okay. So we have about uh, 15 minutes left here, but what I wanna do and what we talked about in the panel and what I talked about with Esther is we want to come out of here with some action items. Uh, there'll probably be a hundred ideas. We want to probably boil them down to two or three. Maybe it's the panel on the road. Maybe it's uh, creating corporate uh, uh, diversity matrix. I don't know what those ideas are, but I'd like, uh, is, are there pieces of paper out there, Esther, that everybody has? So as uh, I say this, and I'm gonna ask the panel a, qu a question here, and then we'll have a, some, some questions, so, so an opportunity for some questions from you. 
I'd like you to, in less than five words, have two ideas and make sure that each idea starts out with an action. Create, begin, publish. You, 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 you figure out what the action verb is. Less than five words per idea. And then Esther and the team will pick those ideas up and uh, we'll try to then with the help of the panel, I think maybe in a second convening that we'll have, uh, we'll try to come up with what those uh, top action items are, may be. You know, maybe we will take a panel like this on the road. Maybe there'll be some other things. And so as you're thinking about your ideas, and I wanna come back to the panel and ask uh, this question, and we'll start with, uh, with Ekta and Kapila. Uh, so at this uh, gathering that I was at in Denver at the Denver Country Club, which only 20 years ago didn't allow any women or <laughs> people of color to go into the Denver Country Club. There was this uh, celebration by the Women's Leadership Foundation of the companies that had done the most uh, to achieve corporate diversity, and Newmont Mining was honored, and uh, the person who is on Newmont Mining and who's the chair of the board is a woman by the name of Noreen Dolan. Noreen is also the chairman of uh, Credit Suisse, and so been around for a long <coughs> time. And one of the things that she said in her comments is that, in, is that Europe was ahead of the United States in terms of diversity. And she said there were some countries who basically came down and said, you need to have a quota in terms of what you're gonna do on uh, inclusion of people from different backgrounds. And she said in the UK, they decided to do something that was a little different, which was to go ahead and set target goals. Uh, I forget what the target was, 30% women on corporate boards by, by a certain date or something like that. And she said that one of the things they did is they went to Tony Blair. And uh, Tony Blair, so they, they basically issued this pledge or this <coughs> target. And then they had Tony Blair send out a letter to each of the significant uh, corporations in the UK. And all of a sudden they had the attention of the CEO, the NAM and Gov Committee, and diversity started happening in those, uh, in those companies. So it was a discussion with her about, is it good to have quotas? Is it good to have targets? Uh, is it good to do it less uh, formally than that? Uh, so what are your views on what ought to happen there? And let me start uh, with Capilla and then uh, let's go to Etka. So I guess uh, my view, and, and some of this is from the stories of organizations like you mentioned, Newmont Mining, and you know, WCD does this, LCDA does this, I'm sure we all do uh, celebrate people who have really made a difference, whether it is uh, around diversity in their ranks or whether it is at the boardroom level. And you know, the common themes that come out of this, and I know this will be discussed later because Charlotte is here and we'll talk about um, you know, this whole tug of war, if you will, between those that believe it has to be either legislated uh, or it has to be um, a, a, a very strong push uh, from those stakeholders. What we're hearing over and over again from our winners, um, and, and I'd be interested in other people's thoughts, is that it comes from a, um, a, a very specific mission at the top of an organization. Uh, and it comes from a recognition, uh, and Toyota has done this really well, about your consumer base. And so it is not the, the, the pressure of Tony Blair, and I won't try to equate that in our, our society, um, but it is, uh, it, it's more the recognition that it's really good for the organization and the either there are stakeholders that are consumers or they are investors uh, or they are uh, others within the organization that make the business case. And the, the people that we have honored over the years, over and over again, that is what we hear. Now, on the flip side, I will tell you, we did a, um, a conference, a WCD conference in Chile, in Santiago in March, and we had the president of uh, uh, Chile is, is female, uh, and came and talked about the importance of diversity on boards. And I will tell you, in Chile, that has not just what she did at WCD, but her focus on diversity on boards has made a difference. So I'm not saying it doesn't make a difference, but I believe that uh, and maybe uh, this is something that others will disagree with, that I believe it comes from the top of an organization, the business imperative understanding what consumers, investors, other stakeholders really want. I believe that is where you get a change, not only at the board level, but throughout the organization. Hector? So I, I think, um, you know, 
like everything in life, it's not black or white, right? And there, there, you need both push and you need pull, right? And that's really what we're all talking about, right? So when do you need you know, a Tony Blair or the president of Chile pushing? And when do you have an enlightened CEO, enlightened board, Exelon, Toyota, many others, who have enlightened leadership, who don't need to be pushed, they just pull because it is the right thing to do and they've lived it. They've felt what cognitive diversity brings to their organizations and why it's an imperative. But you know, having studied um, UK corporate governance, uh, what's happening in Canada as well, as well as in the rest of the world, so you know, the Nordic countries have been very enlightened. The fact of the matter is that, you know, and, and Melody Hobson talks very passionately about this, so in the US, right, so we do not like prescriptive anything in the US, right? We are the land of the free, and that's what we, we stand for. Um, but the fact of the matter is we've been waiting and waiting and waiting for those that need to be pushed to turn into people who pull, right? How much longer are we going to wait, right? There's all this data that says it's not going to happen in any of our lifetimes. So. You know, the, the real sort of question I think we've all got to answer very honestly amongst our organizations and together is, you know, where, when are we going to get to that tipping point? And whatever approach we decide to adopt that's appropriate for our country and for our culture, whether it's targets, whether it's what the UK has done with comply or explain, where their boards actually have to publish and be very transparent about which search firms they use. So it's not just, oh, I know a guy or I know a gal who's diverse, but no, we went and worked with this search firm and we tried everything and here's our skills matrix and we were not successful because da da da, right? And so that sort of, uh, when you shine a light on behaviors that are tied to the values that we all aspire to, good things happen. And as we all know, um, when corporations set their mind on a goal, they go make it happen. They don't just talk about it and they don't just say, well, we tried to do this. They go make it happen. So are we at that point? I don't know, but I think that's for all of you to weigh in on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ekta. So at this point, what I want to do is uh, Esther and uh, Eileen Stapp, can you go around and pick up everybody's piece of paper uh, with your two ideas? Go around table to table. Come on, this this is like a, a classroom. We'll, we'll, we want your ideas. You know, each one of your heads up there has a bunch of ideas. So we want to we want to collect these ideas. So if you have your piece of paper, hold it up, hold it up, and somebody will come around and pick it up. Leisha, you can only get one piece of paper. I saw you with two pieces of paper there. Yeah. Francisco, you came, you came into the room late, so uh, we'll forgive you. We'll pick up your ideas later, but let's see. Who, el who else has some ideas out there? Okay, and then after you've collected all the ideas, why don't you uh, bring them all up to me? Now, this is a distinguished panel, and we had, uh, you know, limited time. This is a kind of conversation that's going out through the day, but it would get to continue for a very long time. So let me ask, uh, uh, let me ask who would like to ask any member of this panel a question? If you, if you have a, rate, stand up if you want to ask a question. Who else would like to ask a question? And, and no one else wants to ask this great panel. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. <laughs> Stand up. Okay, we've got one, two, three, four questions. Anybody else want to, wants to ask a question of basically, uh, I don't know, we call them the Third World Coalition or the Coalition <laughs> of the Future, but this is a coalition that's going to make a house. Okay, so l let me get the names of everybody and uh, we'll go from there. So, uh, I'm sorry, your name? Ellen Ochoa. Uh, Ellen? Ellen. Okay, and uh, Diane Sanchez. Diane? Okay, back. Ben Pat. Ben. 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 I'm sorry, Ben. Elena Rios. And Elena Rios. Okay. All right, here's so we're, and one more question here. Yes, Abby. Abby. Okay. Here's what we're gonna do: Alan, Diane, Ben, Elena, and Abby. You're the only people who get to ask a question. So I'm, gonna ask, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you to hold your question down to like a minute and a half. And then what we will do is for your concluding remarks, say whatever you want to respond to the collective of questions and whatever your concluding remark is on how we move forward. So, Alan, let's go with you first. 
Yeah, so my question is, in terms of helping with the poll, is are any of the organizations um, talking with uh, proxy advisor firms or large institutional shareholders because I think they can have a big impact on a, a non-gov committee or something like that who on their own tend to be pretty conservative. Okay. So proxy shareholders, okay, Diane? My question would be more like, at some point in line with follow the money, and I think you talked about the roadshow. Why don't we, instead of reporting like we did with a corn and fairy, how many board positions are open or what percentage of the boards were not fulfilled or by our diverse uh, base, that we speak to numbers, compelling numbers that justify what kind of purchasing power we have as you mentioned, 250, somebody I mentioned earlier, 250 million people are represented here. As a group, why don't we represent ourselves based on the value we bring so that it's compelling to either public or private sector corporations? Okay, thanks, Diane. Ben? Great, just by a quick way of background, I lead uh, the human capital team for TPG, the global private equity firm. Uh, and my question, this is a rare opportunity to have all of you on stage at once, is what, um, what advice uh, and feedback would you have for us as we think about this in the private company world? One of the areas that uh, the function I lead in our firm focuses on is board development, but obviously in a private company, private equity context. And I'm curious how your uh, organizations and members think about private company board service. It is different. Somebody on the prior panel compared it to being in the tennis match versus being center court at Wimbledon on a public company board, and I think there's some truth to that. Um, but we are, we're, we're very focused on adding uh, an important diversity lens to board development. There's a lot of moments in the lives of our companies and investments where we have an opportunity to either add or influence boards where we're invested to add independent directors. And I'd love to know how we best connect our demand with, uh, with your supply. I think about doing that. Great question, Ben. Thank you, uh, Elena. I have a microphone, but my question is uh, about advocacy, and I think the importance of advocacy you mentioned, um, I see the world as uh, our world, right? We are the emerging majority, and I think the advocacy has to be front and center with our companies, and what would be a number one advocacy um, project, for example, that all of us could work on together, knowing that we are interested in finding champions from our communities that understand the importance of advocacy and not shy away from that. Sure. Thank you, Elena. Abby? I don't need a microphone. <laughs> I'm told. Um, so, uh, I run a startup that focuses, thank you. I, I run a startup called Boardspin that focuses on board services, bringing, so there's a whole new way to think about bringing boards together and, and informing them. Uh, and I'm proud to say I'm a former Russell Reynolds partner, and Charles Trivett taught me a lot about boards. Um, but one of the things that's always frustrated me is, is I pound the table that this is not a, a supply-side problem. It is not. It's a demand-side problem. So my question for the panel and other people here is, would you advocate bringing together a truly, a, a truly publicly available database of diverse candidates? So we can prove it is not a supply-side problem and make those candidates available so anybody can see that and then get the demand side going. Thank you very much. So you guys are smarter than smart. So from Alan, uh, you're talking to shareholders and to, uh, proxies, uh, report to the economic power, uh, basically the economic power that we bring to, to the economy through uh, our communities. Uh, advice from Ben. Ben asked a question on the private uh, equity, private company world. Uh, advocacy, uh, what would be the number one advocacy project? And uh, I, the uh, Abby asked about a publicly available database, whether we ought to form that. So each of you have two minutes to basically give your concluding comment to this wonderful conference here and also to answer whatever parts of those questions uh, you want to, to answer. 
So we're going to start over there, Ekta, and we're going to come down this way. So Ekta, you got a couple minutes. What a great set of questions, right? And I think when we go through those, those chits, we're going to come up with incredible ideas. Um, so I'll work backwards. Um, Abby, your point about truly having a shared, even publicly available, diverse director database. Uh, I know Equilar's made some progress, board spans have got some board. So there are all of these little, you know, uh, thousand flower bloom efforts underway. Um, and I think doing something like that, uh, getting everybody on board would be fantastic. Because once and for all, we've got to kill the, well, it's the supply. No, it's demand debt, right? Um, I'll, I'll then talk about two other things that I have a lot of personal experience with. Um, so I'll talk about private equity and I'll talk about what Ellen uh, raised. On the private equity front, um, you know, having served both clients and boards in a private uh, company context, uh, yes, it may not have the glamour and the name or the brand recognition of the large public company boards, but in so many ways, uh, so much more can be accomplished. Uh, and we heard Raj say this, right? They're more like working meetings. Um, and so there's a real opportunity to have those courageous conversations, to provide those insights, but also to look down the road and to say, look, we need diversity because it's the right thing to do. And it's, in so many ways, it's a lot easier to have those conversations. Um, it's a lot easier to make progress, um, but it does require you know, that enlightened leadership. And so my advice um, to you, Ben, would be, um, you know, you are uniquely placed, um, you know, to make that happen and to do that before companies become public. Because wouldn't it be wonderful? There was, some re there was some re a recent survey that showed that um, uh, startups uh, or venture capital funded companies that were going public were dismal compared to private or public companies, right, in terms of having diverse boards. And we all know that cognitive diversity results in incredible financial performance. That's tightly tied to your mission, so it's a no-brainer. So go do it, lead the way, this way you're ahead of the pack when your companies go public. Show us the way. All right, John. So I'm just going to say, I've been having this conversation with some of the progressive state leaders, like, you know, here you have a great state controller in New York, great city controller here in New York who are very progressive. You know, Rodrigo's here from the State Treasurer's Office of Illinois, very progressive leader, Mike Frerichs. And one of the conversations I've been having with these progressive dynamic leaders is the private equity world has been getting off scot-free. And so in Chicago, most of, the F, most of the private equity firms have never had a person of color as a, as a professional, let alone a partner. And as you know, when they go to see the big pension plans, the pension plan has leverage over them. So do the university endowments and the hospital endowments have leverage over these private equity firms. So first and foremost, we should be demanding that they have diversity on their teams. And again, in Chicago, it's almost like baseball in 1940. There's no one. Um, the second thing is, you know, Bruce Rauner, when he ran for governor, he, he, he ran a firm called GTCR. He mentioned that he had invested in over 400 companies during one of the debates. Well, no one asked him, you know, well, well we know that's, 1,200 CEOs, CFOs, and general counsels. If each one of them had seven board seats, that's 2,800 board seats. How many of them went to women or people of color or diverse communities? No one ever asked that question. And I can tell you, I have never met anyone in Chicago, and I kind of pretty, you know, know a lot of people in Chicago. I've never met anyone that was on a GTCR board or worked in a senior position on a GTCR company or worked at GTCR, not just picking on them. It's the same pretty much in Madison Dearborn. It's the same pretty much at the other private equity firms. So long story short, we can have so much influence here in this room if we ask these private equity firms to look like America in everything they do. And those would be great opportunities for all of us to be on those early boards that lead to wealth creation and other boards. Thank you very, very much. I'm great point. Capella? So I'll try to pick up on a few things that haven't been said because I agree with what has been. Um, so Ellen, uh, uh, um, from my non-gov experience, I think absolutely uh, engaging those uh, investors and stakeholders and pension plans, et cetera, that can really make a difference and, and insist on that. I think we have to be doing that consistently as a combined group because I think right now you'll have WCD has a conversation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have to do this together. And I think that that will be one factor that we really need to focus on. Um, I love the fact that um, Ben is talking about 
about really looking at human capital across a large organization because it, it, it is an area where I think a lot of new directors get some great experience. Um, because I think on public company boards, it's still harder to make the case for that new director and what dynamic will change there. And, it, and, and that's, that, that's great. I hope that other of your peers will also, no, he says no, but um, <laughs> and will engage in that conversation. And if not, follow the money, we, we go that route. Um, I think the comment about reporting is something that I'd like to think about a little bit more. I'm not sure I could uh, answer that in my two minutes. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about what you were thinking with that. Um, and on the advocacy side, I think John is the guy that I see in that advocate role. And so I, I think we, the, hopefully that's one of the calls to action uh, that we come out of here is what is that one advocacy role that we can play within the confines of being not-for-profits to the extent that, that we are. And on the database question, um, I think a database is always a good idea because this is the most fragmented business that I know. Uh, and so I think it's a good idea, but I think it's only one data point in a much larger issue about uh, the way that board members are most comfortable bringing on that next board member is someone that they either know or someone who's had the experience and they can feel comfortable with that. So uh, just one data point. Thank you, Capilla. Matt? All of that and, um, I think two points. One, uh, Ellen, absolutely in terms of engagement with uh, especially major institutional stakeholders. Um, happy to report that uh, KPMG actually helped organize at the Council of Institutional Investors meeting in San Diego just a couple of months ago. A, a not dissimilar panel, actually. Uh, and there the audience was institutional investors. And very pleased to see, again, especially among uh, a number of the public sector uh, institutional fund managers and pension managers an appetite for engaging in these conversations. And I can tell you as someone sitting on the board side, nothing gets the attention of management or the board like one of your major institutional holders saying, so tell me about the diversity on your board, which is a question that is not coming up often enough. Uh, and I, mean, I would close on reporting as well, maybe it's my prerogative as a finance guy, um, you know, whether we have quotas or targets or just goals, if we don't measure where we're at and where we're going, it's going to be incredibly tough to make progress. And that's why I think one of the really significant initiatives underway uh, at the moment is uh, some of the work that the Comptroller's Office here in New York City is doing of turning up the heat on companies to report on the composition of their boards, which is going to force boards to ask themselves <laughs> what do we look like and what do we want to look like. And I think making that available um, for investors and employees and other stakeholders is potentially really valuable. Thank you, Matt. So let me, you know, uh, let me pause. We're not done with this panel, although Esther is going to pull me. Because your ideas are important. And what, I, what we talked about when we had our preparatory call with uh, Esther and others about this is uh, we can have a gathering, but if uh, there's not any action that comes out of the gathering, well, you know, well, we ought not to maybe have even had the gathering, but that's not the case here. So there's going to be an action agenda coming out of here and all these ideas that you've heard about. But just to show you a couple, as I'm, I haven't even got through this, so I'm just taking them randomly. Uh, one, tell the, re tell the search firm that their candidates must be diverse. Number two, conduct board assessment and uh, uh, with regard to future composition. Number one, take the show on the road. Number two, have an honest conversation on the importance of diversity. Encourage more CEOs to make a CEO pledge sponsored by TPWC. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. So Esther, you have a job to do. <laughs> and, uh, Pat and others were involved in this and I'm sure that you see this great panel and uh, from my point of view, I'm also delighted to be of help as uh, we take this agenda across the country and across the world. With that, help me give a great round of applause to Ekta, John, Katia, and Mike.